This morning we begin a new sermon series entitled Light, Life, and Lies, a Love Letter, based on the first letter of John in the New Testament. Church staff love alliteration, luminous, lyrical, loopy, logical alliteration. Light, Life, and Lies. The letters of John were written late in the first century. Despite the way they've been named, we have no indication of the actual author, but scholars compare the grammar and word choice with the Gospel of John and suspect that those who wrote were in that community, John's community. First John isn't written like a typical letter of the first century. There's no typical opening or closing. It's written more like an essay or a sermon with beautiful poetic themes that circle around one another like a crafted composition. Many of the themes in First John echo the opening of John's gospel that we just heard. So I invite you to listen for the echoes in today's reading. Let's listen now for God's word to us from 1 John chapter 1. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This is the word of the Lord. Did you hear the echoing words? Beginning, word, life, revealed, light, in the darkness. The Gospel of John told us that the word became flesh and lived among us. Literally in the Greek, it's pitched a tent in our midst. The letter of John opens with a declaration that this word was heard and seen with our eyes, looked at and touched with our hands. This is the word. The Gospel of John told us the word brings light that darkness will never overcome. And the letter of John calls us to be people who walk in that light. God sent a word to us, the word to us, a complete word, a definitive word, a final word in flesh. Flesh that was seen and touched and heard. God did not choose to send a list of instructions. God did not send a memo or a text message. God did not write in the sand or compose an email. God came and pitched a tent among us as a person. In the first century, that was a scandal. And in some ways, I think for us, it's still a scandal. Theologians have written about the incarnation 
God in carne, God in flesh, God as human. It sounds very spiritual until you stop and begin to question. God was born as a baby in Jesus, a baby that nursed at his mother's breast, a baby that soiled his swaddling clothes, a baby that couldn't talk or walk. God learned to walk and talk as every other child does with a loving encouragement of family. God grew to be a man in Jesus, a man who experienced hum human feelings of joy and pain, feelings of sorrow, fear, anxiety, and loneliness, and feelings of excitement, enthusiasm, desire, and delight. God chose to be revealed to humanity in vulnerable flesh, in reality. God did not stay safely removed. God did not hold us at a distance. God did not protect God's self from human pain. In fact, according to the gospel and to the letter, God chose humanity as a way to show us love. God chose flesh. God chose to pitch a tent and dwell in our midst. I have a pastor friend who asked this question. Did Jesus know that the planet Earth is round, or did he believe it was flat? If you say he knew he was, it was round, you were leaning into the Jesus that is truly God and claiming that he knew all things. Does that mean he knew how to walk and talk and just pretended not to know? But if you say he believed the world was flat, you're leaning into Jesus as a human of the first century with the limitations of the humanity. How can we possibly put these together? How can we possibly understand that Jesus is God revealed to us pitching a tent to live in our midst? Later, in the early 4th century, Roman Emperor Constantine called Christian leaders to gather at the Council of Nicaea to write a statement of faith trying to answer that question. In their world, the debate about Jesus' humanity and divinity wasn't resolved. And their statement, the Nicene Creed, has been revised a bit, but the gist of it remains from that 4th century creed. We'll read it together to affirm our faith in just a few minutes. In the creed, they claim belief in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. The creed almost dances between divinity and humanity, begotten by the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. For us and for our salvation, he came down and was incarnate and became truly human. True God, truly human. It's a dance, it's a tension. For the writer of 1 John, that dance of divinity and humanity dances to the rhythms of love and light. God chose to be revealed because of God's love. God longed for relationship with humanity. God wanted to know us and wanted to be known by us. God chose to live among us because of God's love for us. God chose to be human because God loves humanity. Every single human throughout all of time and space. 
God chose to take on human flesh because God cares about flesh about the reality of human life, the messiness of birth, the challenges of learning and growing, the pain and the sorrow as well as the joy and the pleasure. God cares about the health of body, mind, and spirit. God chose love to shine like a light that illumines in the midst of every dark and difficult human place. So the writer of 1 John proclaims the truth of incarnation in the rhythms of love and light and calls us to walk in that light. Using the phrase, if we say, the writer makes the connection between the words of our belief and the practices of our lives. If we say this, then this is the truth of who we are. If we say this, then we live this way. There's a connection between the spiritual belief and the affirmation of faith and the way we live in the flesh each day. If we say that God was born as a baby Jesus in Bethlehem, vulnerable and at risk with peasant parents who had traveled to comply with a Roman census, then we commit to care for every child born. In the promises that we make at every baptism, in the welcome we give to every traveling family, in the basics we share with every growing child, If we say that God grew into the young man Jesus of Nazareth, learning and growing in wisdom and in strength, then we will devote ourselves to ensure that every growing person has the opportunity for education and opportunity. If we say that God walked the earth healing the sick and feeding the hungry, then we care for the gift of our bodies and the bodies of others. We support health in mind, body, and spirit. We work for policies that ensure every person has nutritious food and clean water. If we say that God's word lived among us, moving toward us in our sin and brokenness, then we will move forward in reconciliation toward people who are broken. If we say that God pitched a tent in the midst of human pain, then we move toward those in the midst of pain with compassion, despite any discomfort or anxiety we feel. We don't turn away or avoid pain of human siblings because God chose to move toward. If we say that the living word was crucified, dead, and buried, and then raised from the dead, then we hold on to hope that new life will triumph over every deadly darkness. If we say, then we love. If we say, then we walk in the light. Our saying and our doing must have integrity. We cannot make claims about God's word becoming flesh and then turn away from the difficulties of any flesh around us. We cannot affirm that Jesus is true God and truly human unless we acknowledge the sacred quality of every human sibling. Will we do it perfectly? Of course not. And the writer knows we'll fail. Our faith doesn't make us perfect. Our own belief won't save us. We confess our sins, and God will forgive. If we confess, God forgives. We're called to walk in the light as he himself is in the light. We are the modern-day incarnation of God's shining love in the flesh. We are God's modern-day incarnation of the shining love in the flesh. So thanks be to God for taking on human flesh, for pitching a tent to live among us. May we embrace the mystery of the true God, truly human Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for the depth and the breadth of a love that longs to know and be known. Thanks be to God for the invitation of grace to walk in the light and to reveal that shining love in a dark and difficult world. Amen.